Hi, um, welcome everybody. Thanks a lot for joining. I'm Michael Mossermans from Christian Aid and I'm moderating this session on mutual aid and on how we can better support crisis affected communities to help each other. Um, I know there's a number of people who will probably join in the next couple of minutes, so we'll, we'll, but we've got quite a lot of speakers to get through, so we'll, we'll try to start now and we'll let others catch up. Please feel free to put um, who you are in the chat, on the, on, on, on the Zoom chats, uh, to introduce yourselves to each other. And um, if during the course of the meeting you've got a question that you'd like to put to one or all of the speakers, please use the Q&A function in zoom where we will um where we will hold all the questions what's going to happen is we're, get, we're going to have in a minute we're going to have a couple of introductory remarks to um from uh, vg and Niels to introduce you to um the topic and and set the scene and then we're going to hear from four um local activists leaders and pioneers who who are involved in or have experienced um mutual aid and who will be sharing their experiences and stories from their context and and then we're going to hear from three um senior representatives of donors who are going to sort of give a donor perspective and lens on the issue and on what they've heard and then we'll move into a um dialogue, a dialogue both between the practitioners and the donors and um, taking on board some of the questions that you put in the Q&A to the extent we have time. Because we've got uh, nine um, speakers upcoming who will only speak briefly, um, uh, we may not be able to answer every single question that you put in the Q&A in this session, but we will do our best to see whether we can answer them in the chat or answer them by writing to you afterwards. Um, so that is um, the introduction. And um, so I'd now like to turn to VG from ALNAP and then after that to Niels from Local School of Protection, just to give us a bit of a scene setter about uh, mutual aid and their roles in it. Great. Thanks, Michael. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm Vijay Lakshmi Viji from the ALNAP team, and we're really excited to be co-hosting this webinar today. Over the past several months, we've been scoping the current practice and learning gaps in the international system, particularly around locally led humanitarian action. The paper will be out in mid-November, and we'll be sharing it with you all then. But I'll just pick up four threads that are specifically linked to today's discussion that I'd like to highlight. The first is that global discussions have mainly been focused on localizing the international system, yet locally led action has always occurred in every crisis situation. Affected people themselves, followed by the surrounding community, are the first responders. At times, this is spontaneous informal support, which we're broadly calling mutual aid. At other times, this is more organized, with initiatives being run by grassroots organizations, local NGOs, or even local government, which we're broadly calling locally led action. And as we found through our scoping, even national and local organizations are finding ways to devolve decision making to communities themselves. Second, despite this, we also see that operational and behavioral gaps remain. At the broadest level, this is about if and how funding can be provided to groups on the ground. But it's also about trust and a change in mindset that still eludes the majority of organizations. Third, we see a gap in actually researching and learning from locally led or mutual aid initiatives, particularly when it comes to the deeper value add that they have for communities on the ground. There are some interesting ongoing programs, including Group URD's ongoing research, Mercy Corps' work around informal social protection, and Local to Global Protection's work, which Niels will introduce. We'll also be putting some links of these in the chat if you're interested in learning more about them. Finally, and fourth, there's a question around the kinds of evidence that we value, the stories that are most widely heard, and who tells them because there's a real absence of Global South voices, both within the conversation and within the literature. I'm sure our panel is going to be bringing a lot of varied insights on some of these points today. And for ALNAP, this is actually an ongoing area of interest. 
So if you are working on innovative programs or research around this theme, do reach out to us. We'll also share um, an email in the chat where you can reach out. Let me stop there for now and hand over to Niels to give us a short introduction of local to global protection and their SCLR approach. Niels. Thanks so much, Vichy. And yes, my name is Niels Carstensen and I'm representing local to global protection here. First of all, a big thanks to, uh, to ALNAP for organizing the event and to our speakers today. I've, I've known the work and the incredible commitment to core humanitarian values of many of you for years now. And it's just such a privilege to have you together here. Local to Global, uh, we're an initiative which has been focusing on documenting and supporting crisis affected communities and, crisis and, and citizens own efforts to protect, to survive and recover for more than 10 years now. Local to Global is a semi-autonomous research and innovation unit, and it's co-hosted by Dan Church 8, Act Church of Sweden, and Christian 8. Given our focus, we are, of course, really excited about the discussion today and the fact that the wider humanitarian system, including ALNAP and many others, are now increasingly taking an active interest in mutual aid and truly locally led responses. Our own research in crisis like Sudan, Myanmar, Palestine testifies to the hugely important role this play in affected people's survival, protection, and possible hopeful recovery. As part of trying to support mutual aid and other forms of locally led response, we've worked with a multitude of local, national, and international colleagues to develop a practical way for insight system responders, such as NGOs, UN agencies, and donors, to find ways to support such local voluntary efforts without jeopardizing them, without destroying them, without turning them into mirror images of ourselves. We call that approach supporting community-led crisis response, and I'll spare you for all the details, but just say you can find a link in the chat, on our webpage, etc. Now it's being used with communal by communities in well Haiti, Ukraine, Ethiopia, Kenya, Sudan, Myanmar, and the Philippines, to name a few. I also have to say, as I'm sure we all have right now, also the people of Israel and Palestine in our minds and hearts. I should add that some 30 plus community groups in Gaza alone have worked with these approaches for years. On top of all the crucial and significant mutual aid, which always has been part of the response there and will be so very much these very hours. Noticed or unnoticed by professional humanitarian actors and mainstream media, these efforts, these citizens' efforts, these solidarity efforts, which are playing out right now, are crucial. Michael, back to you. Uh, great. Many thanks, Niels and BG, for that introduction. So um, without further ado, um, we're going to move on to um, our four local leaders, local practitioners who, who are going to share with us some um, stories about what this looks like in their own experience. So we're going to start with Dr. Mudawi Ibrahim Adam, who runs the NGO, Sudan Social Development Organization, SUDO. So um, Dr. Mudawi, would you like to come in? Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Uh, you know, mutual aid in Sudan, Sudan has a history, it's a social, you know, it is a, it is part of the culture of the Sudanese people, this mutual aid. You could have seen it in, in different times, especially during Ramadan, where you find people coming together, eating, and you find people who are calling people from the road to come to the iftar. Uh, after the, and, and also you have it in what they call nafaga or takia. Nafaga is something made in, in with the Sufis where the people come and eat and go and take years also something like that. After the war, you know, people started uh, spontaneously 
in the first week to start doing uh, some initiatives. Uh, these initiatives uh, were based on the beginning of the resistance committees who have been, you know, the major civil society group which have been working uh, on 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 the transfer on the, the transition of Sudan to democracy. Uh, these rooms started immediately. The research committee started making different rooms for different issues. For example, emergency room for medical supplies, emergency room for uh, evacuation of people, emergency room for supporting families and with food and this. At the same time, there were you know initiatives, uh, local initiatives in every block or every neighborhood people started their own initiative of supporting each other, making food together, eating together, uh, looking after the, the injured or, or, or the people who are sick and all these kind of things. Uh, in, in areas where people have displaced, we have seen initiatives where people started receiving the displaced people Providing them with food, providing them with shelter, providing them with uh, with 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 the different needs uh, in, in the different places, uh, you know, helping these those uh, um, those uh, victims of social uh, sexual violence, uh, doing treatments, um, supporting those. Uh, People are coming from the different areas without anything, collecting the orphans and those who came without families and adapting them with different families. There's a lots, lots of thousands and thousands of initiatives which are going on in the war areas and outside the war area. These are the, uh, from the beginning, you know, people are depending on themselves, they are only sharing. For example, in, in one block, people are sharing money, whatever they have. Some people are getting support from outside, from from their from expatriates, Sudanese expatriates abroad in the Gulf area. And uh, so these are the initiatives which are still going on. People are doing it by themselves, feeding each other. Uh, we as an organization, we started trying uh, to look for funding or different, different, uh, you know, different uh, interventions. Uh, in our mind, that we don't want to break this uh, culture. We don't want to go into an individualistic again. People, you know, tend to be uh, doing uh, solving themselves as individuals. So we try to work on these issues. We worked at the beginning with the emergency rooms in the different areas and opened, for example, in Khartoum, the, the clinics uh, with the people. We, we, we served as an umbrella for the emergency rooms to get uh, medicines from UNICEF, from WHO. We get uh, chlorine and, and, and water, um, water coagulation. Uh, materials from 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 UNICEF so that they can, you know, we can provide people with this. We served as an interlocutor between the, you know, actually non-existing government government agencies who are responsible for water and these kind of things. So that we can we can provide people, we take the, the responsibility of taking the the materials and then in working with the with the uh, emergency rooms in the different places. Lately, we started doing something different. We started creating uh, steering committees from our side so that we can manage the funds, whatever funds are coming. And we uh, have the steering committee with jointly different uh, initiatives which, which, which are working in the same area. So if we wanted to do cash distribution, we wanted to 
do you know support for families or do some things like that or bringing in food we we do we do it through through these steering committees even when distributing nfis and these kind of things we are doing it through steering committees which are working with the local initiatives so that we cannot we don't break we don't replace the, uh, these local initiatives and coming we are as an organization we are a research organization so we have access to fund so that it is it is difficult yes but uh, you know whatever funds we are getting we are we are we are using it through this this mechanism that we work with the with the existing with the existing existing uh you know people's initiatives so that we can do things better uh still we need to work it is it is it is still hard because it is thousands and thousands of initiatives that are working on the ground uh we don't want people to come and you know destroy these uh, initiatives uh, we want to be on it we want to continue with this culture so that you know we can we can continue doing it uh yeah. So that is that is in general what we are we are we are we are doing and that is if if you if there is time I can give some examples of the of the of the initiatives and there are some 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 brilliant initiatives going on the ground for example people who are uh, in in fact there are some of these initiatives are also coming in coordination in areas. that people are coordinating so the little they have in the different in the different uh, initiatives they come together and they form one coordination group for the initiative where they put the money in and they call for for those who have who have who are expatriates or who have money to you know to um uh, contribute to this this uh, this fund uh so this is this uh, for example there is uh, there is uh, people also in these initiatives are making initiatives with farmers for example for displaced people in in jazira area where they are connecting you know those people who are being displaced and with a knowledge of farming they are connecting them with farmers where they come they have the land that farmer has the land these people come in and they uh, do the uh, the work in the farm together they cultivate the land and and they share you know the the, the harvests of the of the, of the these these are initiatives for example there are initiatives also in the line of the uh, protection uh, where you know uh, victims of social, sexual violence are being recorded and they, they have been treated they have They, they have been, you know, uh, they are given uh, psychosocial support and, and also they are medical support, whatever uh, victims like this. People are okay. doing. <laughs> there are, thank, there thank, are thank. initiatives, very interesting initiatives actually. For example, people who are making their, you know, local, local, local mm-hmm. dignity. and and supporting families who are you know being displaced from Khartoum in in these different areas so thanks a lot dr madawi thanks. Th- thanks a lot thanks a lot for sharing um all those initiatives um we will come back to you in the um q and a later to hear more but perhaps um in the interest of time to enable um our several other speakers to share their own views we'll we'll move on to um myanmar at this point and we have um mr moon from myanmar who's um an experienced practitioner and um i think he's going to talk to us about how civil society groups came together in myanmar when most of the international actors left when the junta took over and mr moon is a pseudonym and mr moon's not going to come on camera um for security purposes given the situation in in myanmar but over to you mr moon thank you maka uh hello everyone uh good evening from myanmar 
Uh, I'm working in Myanmar with the local organizations for quite a long time. Uh, this is a quite a privilege to be here and uh, talk with you. So the coup in the February 2021 is the beginning to the road to fill state for Myanmar. The gender is threatening and systematically scrutinizing the access to those in need, those who are supporting the IDPs with their own resources or collective resources were arrested and sentenced to over 10 years imprisonment. And most of the NGOs are free, send out their own safety and security guidelines and systems, and also to avoid the confrontation with the gender and staying safe in their own net. So uh, some NGOs already have left the country and some become paralyzed. Some are trying to find local partners to work for them. Uh, a lot of people have left uh, their homes and works because of the uh, oppression from the gender and also for the civil disobedience movement and businesses and native places to run away from the arrest and killing bombardments used as a human shield, rape and torture. The IDPs have uh, to flee from one place to another. Uh, some IDPs have been uh, like uh, moving from place to place, some are already in different places for more than five times. Uh, as the gender troops are trying to target the ID, IDP camps intentionally. The community and the CSOs take the initiatives for responding to the affected displaced community before any organizations can start the emergency response. The response varies from transportation of the people to the safe places. Sometimes the tra transportation means sometimes uh, on food, and sometimes uh, they have to cross over different uh, streams and uh, rivers. And also uh, they have to support some of the emergency medical support to the wounded, arrangement of the food for the displaced community, caring for traumatized and frightened ones, psychosocial support to the children, caring of the elderly, pregnant women, and uh, people with disabilities and men. Uh, also, sometimes uh, if there are a lot of children, they also have to create non formal education for the young children uh, while they are in the displacement. Needless to say that uh, there are enormous benefit of mutual aid. Uh, just a few visible ones are like the, uh, the NGOs, they have to do a lot of assessment before starting any kind of intervention. But the community, they do, they know their places, their area, their people, their stakeholders, and the situation very well. So they they do not need to do pass through these kind of assessment. Uh, that brings the the responses to the humanitarian needs very quick. And the the uh, one I would like to express well, one of the incidents uh, that we have uh, come across. In, in that incident, there was a fierce fighting between the gender and the ethnic armed forces in the Northeast region of Myanmar. All the UN and INGO, national NGO officers are trapped in the urban area because they, most of their officers are in the urban area uh, for the coordination and good connection, uh, can, thanks, things like that. So uh, as they are in the urban area, they are trapped because the fightings are happening just around the the uh, city area. They could not move, move even an inch out of the city area. At the time, the C uh, CSOs who have been previously uh, coordinated and trained in emergency response, did all the supports and responses with the preposition -pre items near the area, their area. The NGOs could reach to that area only after three, four days of the displacement. To connect with the community that are doing mutual aid, we also have to do so some of our parts. We have, we have to do a lot of trust building and prepare ourselves to and learn because uh, sometimes we, the INGOs, uh, think that uh, we, are, we know better than the local communities. So we need to and learn. And to be able to, to take part in the lives of the communities, we also need to do a lot of advocacy to the community and different stakeholders and also the donors. We also need to adjust our programming to be in line with the tempo and the context of the uh, uh, of the community. So uh, 
these are some of the things that uh, we have been uh, uh, seeing in the community that, uh, that the uh, mutual, mutual aid uh, connection and responses uh, for the current, uh, uh, current crisis in Myanmar. We can talk later in the, in the after parts. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Mr. Moon, for that interesting story, stories from Myanmar. Um, to move on, I'd, li I'd like to turn to our third um, local leader, um, Mr. Salad Liban Arero, who's the CEO of the organization SIFA in northern Kenya. And um, I think that Salad is going to um, potentially share with us some stories ab about how uh, micro grants have helped communities um, in drought affected and conflict affected regions of northern Kenya to thrive. But over to you, Salad. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Uh, good uh, afternoon, everyone. It is 12.27 here. Uh, my name is Arsalad Liban. I, uh, my camera is off because of some uh, internet issues. I am currently speaking from some very remote parts of Kenya in a place in a county called Tukana in the north. Yeah, my name is Arsalal Liban, and uh, we are. I work for CIFA as the CEO. We are 24 years old as a humanitarian organization, and we have, uh, over the years, implemented all types of humanitarian supports, including trying to uh, work on how to alleviate poverty among our people. We are working among a community that is uh, facing all kinds of, uh, of stresses due to climate extremes. The poverty level is high. The people have lost their livelihoods, and there's a. We are in fact in a situation where eighty percent of our population are depending on food aid. Most of this support that we've been giving to the communities have not been very effective, and uh, we were not able to reach everyone who wanted, who needed our support. And uh, until a time came when Christian Aid introduced SCLR to us, that was in 2019. And uh, I would also like to thank Christian Ed because it is the only organization that is uh, supporting uh, SCLR projects in, in this part of the country. Now, as our name suggests, we, in fact, we are always wanted to work through community initiatives, as, and our name is Community Initiative Facilitation and Assistance. That is what we are always wanted to do. We are 24 years, and at least we never had the opportunities because projects have been dictated to us by people who have been giving us resources. I'm sorry to say this. And uh, in fact, that is how we've been working. But because this was our dream all the time, at least we were able to have introduced this to our communities. And uh, currently, we are, in fact, getting enough, uh, some substantial results from what we are doing. We are working with, in, with the communities in uh, some parts of Mercerbit County. We are working with a uh, so far, from the, for the last two years, we are working with around seven, seven groups, and uh, we are trying to reach as much as many people we can. And uh, in fact, uh, we have so far supported around 67 groups in these regions. And uh, the individuals who are facing primary impacts of this, uh, our interventions are around 12,564. Apart from the humanitarian work, we've been supporting groups that are doing something that something that will support other members of the of the communities at least they get the support as a group self-help group and they're also supporting other members of the community and in fact through this we were able to get a, 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 other achievements and uh, we have a, a, so far out of the 67 groups we have achieved the local infrastructure repairs for 11 projects public health support for one project livelihood recovery support for 36 projects, food production for 18 projects, environmental protection for one project. All this for a total sum of uh, only Great Britain pounds 103,096. As we all know this, the aim of SCLR is, uh, is to increase the scale and impact and momentum of crisis affected people's own initiatives to help each other to survive with the dignity, strengthen, communal well-being and start addressing root causes of vulnerabilities. What are the emerging benefits that we have observed so far? One thing we have observed is that it is more responsive, it fits local needs and opportunities. The other thing is it's faster. When a crisis strikes, we are able to intervene very fast because we have the funds ready and the community start implementing the, 
their projects immediately. The other thing is it's cost efficient. Because we are using less money to reach more number of people. As I said, we are uh, through 67 groups, we are able to reach 12,564 needy households. The other thing is that it is cost efficient. We are using less money to help more people. Because our people are learning to help each other, we are able to reach more people because of this. The other thing is uh, the other good thing about STLR is the psychological benefits. Because, you know, there is that dignity, that hope that we create as a result of this. The other social benefit that we are able to observe as a result of SCLR is that we are able to see social cohesion between communities. We have also observed that the communities are trying to help each other, help themselves, help each other and also help themselves. There's that self-help. And the great thing about it is that it is trying to create accountability, both vertically and horizontally. At least there's that aspect of accountability and everybody's accountable. The groups that are receiving the funds are accountable to the communities. They are accountable to, the, to, to us as we are accountable to the, to, the, to the donor. The other thing is that it is holistic and uh, you can do a lot of, uh, so it has no barriers and uh, it allows relief development, it allows protection projects, it allows services and even peace building projects, which is a problem in our area. The other thing is about capacity building through learning by doing. Although we believe, you know, at least one of my uh, my trainers told me that it is a risk, risky venture. We are giving the communities, and we, there's no much, so much, uh, there's no so much follow up. So what happens is, we give grants to group, and when they make a mistake, we don't push them so so much for this. So what do we do is we try to help them identify the mistakes. Where was where did it go wrong? Once we realize where it has gone wrong, and at least we are able to work with the groups again to make sure that that. Uh, they do it right the next time. The other thing is that it encourages and accelerates long-term process because through SCLR project we have we help the communities understand why what happened why why did this crisis happen okay why was it so severe why, why were the impacts so severe so at least we agree with the communities on what we can be done better in future. So at least we have started helping our communities to start, to start thinking about the future. And uh, these are one of the achievements that we have achieved so far. And then we have also, we develop structures within the communities. There's accountability communities, there's community resource person, and our work as an organization is just to supervise and see what that what the, whatever they are doing is right. So you see at least com because the community are, are doing this thing for themselves. So at least they did improve understanding and they are learning to take responsibilities, their responsibilities for themselves. So these are one of the good things that we were able to observe as a result of, the, of this. And then we also seeing, seeing something about a stronger response, recovery and transformation because the community is, try, is trying to transform. Because as we, we discuss the SLR issues, at least this is also helping the communities understand their problems better, the root causes of the, of the poverty, the root causes of uh, all their problems. So as a result of this, they are able to come together as a community and think about how best can we face uh, these problems in the future. So this okay. is one of the, yeah. No, okay, thanks a lot, Salah. That that's great. Really interesting. Um, we're gonna we're gonna move on to the next speaker because of the interest of time. But we will um, come back to hear more from you in the Q and A. Many many thanks. So. Um, Next, um, I'd like to turn to Mr. Hajuj Kuka, who's the external communications officer for the Khartoum State Emergency Room, as well as being an activist and a filmmaker. Hajuj. Yeah, hi, everybody. I'm just going to try to make this short. So, um, so the war started in April 2023, Sudan. And initially what happened was the uh, international community, uh, the international NGOs, the UN, all these uh, people, they started evacuating. So their priority was how to evacuate as soon as possible to evacuate their staff. And at that point, we reached out to a few of, uh, of them that we we're close to, and we tried to, to tell them, okay, so what can we do? We need help, things are on the ground, what can be done? And although they didn't have money to give us or any funds in the beginning, what they had to give us is they were empowering us with ideas. And the first of them was mutual aid, solidarity economy, uh, how do you decolonize humanitarian aid? How do we have, how, what do we need to put in place so we can actually talk to donors? So we started looking internally. And the beginning, what we had was a lot of diaspora money. 
we had uh, people from the diaspora who were helping. So uh, although you will hear stories about humanitarian aid did not reach Sudan until I don't know how long, humanitarian aid reached Sudan the first day of the war. So people started sending money to their families and all that. But soon uh, people started getting their families out of, out of Khartoum. Uh, about 4 million people were removed from Khartoum. And you can imagine it's the, it's the middle class, it's the people who have uh, family outside who could take them out. So the money dried out. Um, also, one, one important thing happened really early on is we're living in a city and cooking gas was something that we just stopped. So people started uh, trying to figure out how, how do they do it without cooking gas. So they went to a school and started uh, getting charcoal and wood and were not cooking together because of the lack of cooking gas. At that time, they still had food. So they were getting food from their own houses and they started cooking together. And in the beginning, it was a bunch of men sitting there, young men cooking and trying to uh, give food uh, to the families around and whatnot. But soon women came and amazingly did this revolution of taking over the kitchen, which sounds not like a revolution, but it was a fight to take it over. Uh, and what they had was better ways to cook. They knew where to get food from. And when they did that, also they brought the children with them. And we're living in a war zone. So we're, we're taken over by this militia. So going to a soup kitchen was the only thing activity that you can do where the soldiers will allow you to go and because they wouldn't allow you to go around, be around. So people started coming to the kitchen, one to cook and eat together. And uh, that was huge. Then kids were there, but they started having all the psycho uh, social uh, activities that started going on. Uh, some people got books from their homes. The library started. Uh, uh, somebody started planting uh, salads. Uh, some people started... Uh, giving classes to the children, playing games with the children. Um, there was a room that uh, they started calling women break room. So now you had uh, a, a, a women only safe room. Uh, at the time, we didn't even know the terminology, but, but uh, we started to figure out. So all this started happening uh, um, because of this idea of coming together. Um, during that time, we actually started building our structure. So we had these uh, emergency response rooms are actually scattered throughout of Khartoum. Right now we have 69 uh, emergency response rooms, base emergency response rooms in Khartoum. And for example, the one I come from, my base, uh, one in my neighborhood, has um, six kitchens, uh, eight women co-ops, I'll talk to you about that, what that is, and a clinic. So all that is in one of the 69. Um, that's, that's in Khartoum. When you go to Darfur, there's also others and stuff. And uh, if I have time, I'll, I'll talk about our relationship with uh, Darfur. So we started and we tried to, okay, how do we coordinate together? Because for NGOs, for international NGOs and we're not to work with us, they need to, to talk. They can't talk to 69. They can't talk to everybody on the ground. Uh, if you leave it for the NGOs and they already had started that, they'll support the ones they had networks with, which most probably will be the ones that had somebody who speaks English in them, but they wouldn't be able to reach uh, the whole communities. So coming from the revolution, uh, we had the idea of, uh, and I'll keep it one last minute. So coming from the re revolution, we had uh, the idea that uh, the way to go forward is through these uh, local parliaments. So we came together, we, we established something called the local parliament, uh, which ran through their seven uh, uh, districts in Khartoum. So we got a representative from each district, and then we wrote a charter, which is our constitution. And then we had working uh, groups that included uh, uh, committees that do programming, finance, uh, reporting, and external comms, and also then offices that do health uh, uh, services and all that. Um, so I'll, for, to keep it short, uh, I'll, I'll stop it here, but I uh, hope in the questions and answers, we can talk a little bit more deep on how we we try to do group cash transfers instead of individual cash transfer, how we have these amazing things, the women co-ops and all these ideas that came really internally and we're, we're figuring out and using these terminologies that is empowering us to actually deal with the international community and at the same time keep everything local. Thank you. Great, uh, great. Thanks, Hajuj. Okay. Um, so the next part of the conversation, before we get to a dialogue, we're just we're going to hear from um, 
our three donors who've, who've kindly agreed to join the panel. So we have got Susan from Irish Aid and Dylan from the UK's FCDO and Andrea from USAID. And it's incredibly early in the morning in, in the US. So so um, thanks so much for your forbearance in, in joining us at this hour. So maybe we'll start with um, Susan, just to share a few reflections on um, how um, Irish Aid is trying to support more organic, locally led, action and um, what challenges may exist in being able to do so. Okay, thanks, Michael, and good morning to everybody. Um, thanks to the speakers for really a hugely informative account of the work. I think really what's immediately striking is the, the really considerable, the, the, the incredible amount of organic locally led action that's taking, you know, taking place on the ground that really is a lifeline to millions of people in these crisis contexts. Um, I think maybe just a couple of reflections first. Um, I think the first thing that struck me was the importance of flexible funding. Um, I think several speakers mentioned about, you know, being able to respond at the right time in the right place with the right kind of assistance. And that's what we hear again and again from our partners is that, you know, the quality funding is so important and, you know, almost as important as the amount of funding is the kind of funding that donors are giving. Um, second point really is probably an obvious one, but really the importance of really a really in-depth understanding of the context um, that our partners are working in um, and how we can support them in the most appropriate way. Um, you know, and how the, the crisis impacts on different parts of civil society and, and their ability to, to operate. Maybe just to run through quickly a few areas where Ireland is supporting um, locally led action. And I should say that for now, actually, the emphasis is probably more on the locally led action than the mutual aid part, um, although we're trying to move towards that. Um, the first really is our five year flexible funding to our Irish NGO partners, uh, where we have built in mutually agreed benchmarks on how to advance um, support for locally led action. And it's early days, but we're seeing you know, positive um, progress. We're seeing much more diverse partnerships, longer term partnerships, more passing on of quality funding. So not just passing on of funding, but quality funding, which includes support for overheads, um, efforts to shift that balance of power and ceding local space to local actors. So a real move, move away from the, the more traditional INGO, um, national local NGO partnership. Um, We've already heard this morning about the SCLR approach. So several of our partners are, including Christian Aid, are implementing the SCLR approach. And more generally, what we're seeing is, you know, five-year flexible funding really allows our NGO partners to support much more stronger community participation and accountability that really needs time. Um, the second is through support to pooled funds. And Ireland is a strong supporter of the UN country-based pooled funds also the START network. I just have maybe to mention a couple of things, um, positive progress in the last few years. We have seen obviously in the metrics, good progress, but maybe a little bit more granular. Recently, we saw the Sudan country based pooled funds, a kind of encouraging initiative to include an allocation for local responders, which included voluntary based civil society groups. And also a bit more flexibility around subgranting to partners um, that are not officially registered with the fund. So these kind of exceptions um, tailored to the context we think are really important. And the START um, network also had a pilot looking at how to target, um, address the real barrier of risk through a tiered due diligence framework. So targeting risk management at different levels. And that really helped to increase the number of local partners receiving funding from the START fund. The third um, area is around dedicated funding. So, you know, just leaving it to flexible funding is not automatically going to result in progress on locally led action. So in some of our partnerships, for example, with IRC, um, we've agreed that 20% of the funding will be channeled to women led organizations in the Horn of Africa. And then where we have missions, we've actually seen positive trends in our support to local organizations. We have five year mission strategies with built-in support for grassroots organizations, networks, and, and local consortia. My last point then, the final point is around how Ireland as a government, and maybe not so much as a donor, but as a government, how we use our advocacy and diplomatic engagement to champion locally led action. And this covers many areas of our work, but it's about ensuring that the role of local actors is recognized and, and valued and that their voice is heard in different fora. 
Um, just as an example, during our presidency of the Security Council, 14 of the 17 briefers that we brought to the table were from local civil society and peacebuilding communities. And we also believe that language is really important. So at the General Assembly, in the Human Rights Council, at the European Union, Ireland is consistently advocating for language that highlights the role of community and local humanitarian workers. Now, I know that some of this might seem very far away from the delivery of humanitarian assistance on, on the front line in these really difficult um, humanitarian crises, but we really believe that this kind of consistent reference to locally led action at that high level will hopefully over the longer term contribute to changing practices and approaches on the ground. You asked me to look at a couple of challenges, so just briefly, um, I think maybe, first of all, to start with one that's more specific to Ireland. Um, one challenge is probably our limited but growing footprint in, in many humanitarian crises. For example, we heard this morning about Sudan and Myanmar. So for Ireland, those are countries of secondary accreditation for us where we have no mission um, in the country. And this does, the, the reality is that this does reduce our ability to engage directly with local organisations on the ground. And for that reason, much of our support in these contexts um, go through an intermediary. One general challenge, and then I'll, I'll finish, um, is probably, I think, that a frustration for all of us is the slow pace of progress. Um, I think that, you know, when we sit in different meetings, absolutely, there, everybody's on board in terms of the principle of locally led action. There is widespread buy-in. But then moving from that rhetoric to action on the ground seems a bit trickier. And um, I think VG mentioned this actually in her introduction was that I think that as we're entering a period from a donor perspective as well with more pressure on our aid budgets, increasing focus on value for money, it's really important that collectively we can clearly articulate the added value of supporting locally led action. And we've heard about some of that this morning, but it's really, I think, important that we can articulate that very clearly and consistently. But also, I guess, we quite often we focus on all the challenges. I think there's lots of opportunities as well, so not to forget them. Um, it was interesting, the Secretary General recently said in New York that the SDGs won't be saved in New York, they'll be saved in your communities. And I think, you know, for me, that comment really reflects the growing recognition of the role of community-led action and mutual aid. Um, and it also underscores the importance of the conversation that we're having today. So really interested to hear from others and look forward to the conversation after. Thank you. Many thanks, Susan. Um, I'll move on to Dylan then. So Dylan, thanks for joining. Maybe you want to reflect on what you've heard so far, maybe what FCGO is up to in this domain mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, any, like like Susan was talking about, and maybe it's similar, what, what challenges might still exist? Great. Uh, thanks, uh, Michael. And just first of all, just to say how hugely inspiring uh, what I've heard uh, today has been. And I think, you, you know, all, all these examples of mutual aid, we're not, <coughs> it's not something we've specifically been looking at. Uh, we've been looking at localization much more broadly, and I can, you know, I'll comment on that. And we, we're doing a lot of similar things to, to what Susan has outlined. But I think this, this idea of mutual uh, aid is, is a really um, significant one for me and I think we need to look at how we engage with that and how our, our kind of localization approaches which are more organized I think than the, than, than the sort of spontaneous nature of mutual aid how does that fit so what's what does the interface uh, look like I think you know if you take the broader context you know we know that humanitarian needs are at an all-time high the global appeals are massive um, and we've heard some really good examples of great value for money and we need we know the system needs to change if we're really going to actually move away from having to provide humanitarian aid and to being more resilient and, and looking at uh, livelihoods development and community development etc so i think i think you know this is has a real good opportunity for us to start to look at that in terms of um you know what what the uk is doing uh we we do recognize localization in our sort of broad international uh, framework so our humanitarian framework talks about this we're doing quite a lot of work on uh, women's rights and women's led organizations and, and we have a sort of big gender strategy and we feel that that's that's very important and, and also local actors are, are, are appearing in most of the sort of thematic areas we're working on so in climate looking at climate financing um and, and particularly on on the humanitarian side as, as well um <clears throat> and i think you know we we need to recognize much more the role that national and local actors uh play um, and it, I think too often we try to 
basically mirror image the international system on the local level system whereas actually we need to be looking much more at what's what does the local system look like and how can we be more agile to shape our strategies around what what happens on, on the on the ground and what these local structures are, are looking like um and i and i think also you know some of this agenda an important piece for us is inclusion so we really do need to make sure if there's you know the spontaneous mutual aid but also it does recognize you know minority groups lgbt plus people uh, women's groups so so it's, so there are some standards and and some things that we would want to to make sure we're, we're part of this and as donors you know we do need to use all our levers and as susan mentioned the sort of diplomatic um piece we we do have <clears throat> you know lots of different diplomatic levers and we're looking much more at how we use those both in the security council but also through ambassadors and again, we have a, quite a large network of, of posts and people in country. And I think one of the things we, we should encourage is a greater interface between the sort of local groups and 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 our, our, our embassies. And I was really pleased to see in a number of the, the examples that the networks that are being established, um, because it's very difficult for us, you know, when you have limited numbers of people to engage with lots and lots of small groups. But if you've got networks with representatives, that, that makes it easier for us to have an, have an interface. So I think, you know, that would be really interesting to explore. Um, we also need to look at this issue about how we get much solutions designed by um, local communities and, and particularly in protracted crises. And again, Susan mentioned a sort of similar thing that, that we are looking at in terms of longer term support in, in these areas, flexible financing. And quite often we, we provide that to the intermediaries. It might be INGOs, it might be the UN, uh, it might be the Red Cross, but then that those benefits are not necessarily passed down to the communities. So I think there's a sort of real need to look at the intermediaries and, and who act as donors and how they are doing programming differently. And I think we've seen some, some good examples of, of, of that uh, today. Um, just a few a few examples. Um, oh, and, and I should say also, you know, as, as we do that, we'd probably have to accept um, things like, you know, we have less visibility over results from the start of a program. So there are so there are compromises we would need to make in how how we finance things. But there are also um, sort of accountability issues, both to affected popu uh, populations, but also to our own taxpayers in terms of the, the sort of due diligence pieces. And we need to look at look at how we how we evolve those. So that's the sort of challenge. Um, I won't go into the detail because Susan's already mentioned it, but I was going to mention country based pooled funds. You know, we see those as a real significant opportunity. And I think, again, you know, Michael, we need to work with organizations like Christian Aid and Niels Yours to look at what how do country based pooled funds recognize this issue of mutual aid? What should they be doing differently? To, to support it. So I think there is a, a discussion to be had on that. And, not, and likewise, we're also uh, big fun funders of the START network. Um, and, and I know that there's been <clears throat> a lot of work in, in particularly START fund Bangladesh uh, in, in supporting a whole local network of actors. So again, are there examples that we can, we can take to scale a bit? Um, I, I mentioned gender equality. We've got a new women's rights organization and women's movements program, um, which is trying to strengthen those organizations. And I think here is where, in, in other work, we recognize that we can't continue to just provide money for people to deliver stuff. We need to actually build capacity. We need to provide overhead costs. We need to be able to support uh, local organizations to be doing advocacy work. So, so the recognition that we shouldn't just be providing, you know, that these are not just service providers, that this is actually about changing the system and, and, and getting representation in, in decisions that affect people in, in, in the communities that these organizations serve. Um, we are doing other other things differently. So interestingly, after the Turkey Syria earthquake, uh, we've financed with a number of other donors the aid fund for northern Syria, uh, which is a multi um, donor million dollar uh, pooled fund, but working largely through Syrian NGOs and not INGOs. So so there are ways of doing this, but I think they're few and far between. And we probably need to to learn more. And then maybe finally, just to say, I mean, like others. We think this debate is absolutely central to um, delivering better humanitarian aid. And um, our, we, we're uh, about to publish a new white paper. We think this this will probably be quite a central element of that. Can't say too much about it yet because it's still being written. But I think, you know, we and you, you know, you, we were also seeing Martin Griffiths talk about people centered approaches. You've got the Ultra flagship program. So there does seem to be a general movement in the right direction. <clears throat> and I think it's it's that for me, the right direction also is not just to continually talk about donors giving direct checks to local organizations. It's about how the system works much better for local organizations. And we and we are much more people centered in the way we, in which we design 
solutions. And my very last uh, quick response on challenges. So, um, so there are challenges on this agenda, um, and we need to address those. I think the, the biggest one is, is around capacity uh, and the number of partnerships we as, a, as, as the UK government are able to manage. We only have so many staff. Uh, so, you know, that 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 therefore indicates, like I think Susan said, working more through intermediaries and looking at how, how they're doing things. Um, <clears throat> but we also face big challenges around our risk and due diligence um, processes. So, you know, some of this can be overcome through sort of what we call patient program development. Um, but we do need to kind of explore how we streamline our due diligence and, and look at a little bit more alignment around approaches uh, to from donors. And I think there's this idea of passporting. Michael, you and I and a number of others were in a, a, a couple of days in Copenhagen last week where we talked about exactly the same sort of issues. So I think there's a there's a building consensus. Um, <clears throat> we also need to make sure locally that doesn't by default mean um a less inclusive approach and so there are there are some things as i said earlier that we need to, to to be looking at on 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 some of these sorts of things and particularly around gender political social sort of conflict dynamics um and then there are challenges um in, in terms of um obviously local organizations accessing funds um and we do recognize the critical role that these these organizations play so so i think lots in there and lots of lots of great stuff in the discussion today and i think this idea of mutual aid is something that we need to sort of better understand but i, I would say the values that we hold for localization and our, our approaches to localization are very similar to the values that are being expressed by the other panelists and, and in the kind of approach to mutual aid so there's there's definitely a divergent of thinking back to you thanks um great uh, many thanks dylan and um uh, the white paper sounds interesting, so look forward to seeing what it comes up with. Um, so over to Andre. I mean, same kind of questions, maybe some reflections from ESAID about what you've heard and about um, maybe some directions that you're taking or, or, or remaining obstacles. First of all, uh, thank you so much for convening uh, this group on this really important topic and just being a platform for sharing and learning and exchange. I think this is a really important medium to do these. We don't do this often enough, I think, as donors. So thank you very much uh, for this opportunity. And also just for, I'm humbled to be part of this community here with Dr. Mudawi and Hajuj and Salad and uh, Mr. Moon, who have really taken the lead here in, in responding in crisis um, and um, happy to be here. Um, I also just wanted to say, uh, I'm not a humanitarian in the classical sense, but I'm very glad to be here uh, to join this discussion. I sit on the development side of the house, so to speak. Um, so I'm working to uh, advance longer term thinking, uh, and in particular in the two countries that I work on, on Sudan and South Sudan. And this is a, an extremely relevant conversation, I think, for the development uh, sort of community more broadly as well. Um, I will stick to some of my comments, particularly on, on the Sudan examples in particular, but I also just wanted to upfront recognize and acknowledge that I keep hearing a clear message from the various people that I talk to um, about the frustration um, and discontent um, with the formal aid system, particularly in the Sudan response right now. So I want to recognize that off the top. Um, and I know that that's also um, fueled a lot of cynicism, I think, about internationals in general. And so I just wanted to um, acknowledge that at the beginning. Um, and I also uh, um, assure people that we're trying to work to fix ourselves a little bit <laughs> um, in addressing some of these challenges. Um, so I wanted to frame my reflections just on, on around three themes in particular, which I heard um, and picked up. And I, I will try not to repeat what my other donor colleagues have, have mentioned here. Um, first is just simply uh, the leadership um, of the local and recognizing who is actually leading and the response I think is really important. Um, in Sudan, the Sudanese civilians have been leading long before April 15th. Uh, uh, April 15th was just another point in the history uh, for them, but civilians have been involved in negotiating ceasefires and peace building. Um, have, and as, as others have heard here, they have absorbed, displaced into their own communities, um, and they've led the charge on that. Um, then we just need to look at the December Revolution to be reminded of the largest homegrown uh, social movement in recent memory that that deposed uh, a leader, I think, and and we saw thousands of people on the street um, it, helping themselves uh, sustain a long protest. Um, and at that point is when we really, as donors, should have really started thinking about how we change that model to support them. Really, back then, um, uh, 
with eight with the outbreak of conflict in April, I think the myth of aid dependence was really turned on its head um, when we saw the mass exodus of internationals, as Hajuj and others mentioned here. Um, and that's when the response began immediately, um, locally. Um, and Sudanese themselves took responsibility for protecting and caring for their own people. Um, and this is really humbling to donors, right? That they're to, to recognize that the Sudanese weren't getting services from the organizations that we typically fund um, and, um, and were responding themselves. So in other words, for us, so if we do business as usual, we become, we donors become the parallel alternative system that splinters the assistance, doesn't help it. Um, and that's what I think this, the mindset that we're all talking about here in terms of changing. So we need to think about lead and 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 shifting the way we think and approach and deliver assistance to support you leaders. You're not beneficiaries. You're leaders in this process, um, and um, and we're slow, and 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 um, we need to do better. Um, the second theme, just that I picked up, is also on on implementation again, from for and by the local responders, um, in a way that works for them. And, a work, and, and for their neighbors and for their communities. And this is where donors, again, can truly play a role in supporting localization. Um, the humanitarian community has been a lead in this um, for many years at the forefront in trying to localize uh, um, responses. And for the US government, I think we're trying to do that more institution across institutions as well. Um, we've been mandated to do that through legislation, through the Global Fragility Act. Some of you might have heard of that, which is a new approach, which is supposed to include a commitment to locally driven solutions um, and based on 10 year strategies, longer term thinking um, based on locally led responses. And so it also, and it's also meant to recognize the fragmented and top down nature of foreign assistance and, and recognize that that's actually part of the problem and how we as the US government have responded in conflicts as well. Um, so for us, this also includes how we manage funds and how we um, disperse funds. And we've heard from our, our other donor colleagues here about changes that are being made. And, and we are doing that as well. And I can talk a little bit more later. I don't want to take too much time now. But I think in general, this is hard um, for us to do. But I think and particularly in the Sudanese context, we've been doing it, I think, for a while, not at the scale that's needed, um, but we are doing it. I, I think finally, third, my third theme that I wanted to acknowledge was just the theme of accountability. Um, that I've heard um, today, whether it's vertical or horizontal. But donors are nervous about accountability um, and our nerves and fears slow us down um, in our ability to further respond quickly. Um, but mutual aid is accountability and it's in, its in its purest form of accountability. And it's a type of bottom-up accountability that I think um, we need to learn from. Um, the examples that Hajuj provided and Dr. Mudawi in particular on Sudan show this, that that. The, the power of the accountability of the local response um, and also the, the legitimacy of this of the locally led response, which is really important for the communities. So for us, for donors like USAID, this means giving local actors the authority to hold us as donors accountable for and our own implementing partners accountable for achieving the outcomes that they want to see. Um, without that bottom-up accountability, it's really, um, it's hard to, we are perceived to be spending money on tasks that really are outlined in some project document on a shelf somewhere rather than really rolling up our sleeves and adapting and ensuring that the paper actually fits with what's happening on the ground. And I think that's where the gap lies. Um, I'll stop there on the sort of the reflections. Quickly, I think um, on the uh, response, uh, we have a variety of mechanisms. As many of you know, we have a very large budget on Sudan on the humanitarian side in particular. Um, and we channel most of our funding through bilateral mechanisms with uh, large NGOs and the UN system. Um, we do have a couple of more uh, flexible funding mechanisms and those are the ones that we are um, using um, to adapt uh, to the situation on the ground. I can provide some particular examples, maybe when we circle back on, on the discussion, if that's helpful, but I, because I did want to touch on the challenges in particular, and I think um, I'm, I'm going to mirror a lot of what my donor colleagues have mentioned, but I think one of the key things perhaps that I'll delve into a little bit is just um, recognizing that as donors, we also need to improve our own understanding of the a situation on the ground and our own analysis in particular, um, um, and, 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 um, uh, 
this can inform our approach in a much better way, in a conflict sensitive way, um, and also um, what's most appropriate at the time. Um, so this actually means um, uh, having engaging in dialogues like this to really understand um, what the challenges are. And as I think as Susan mentioned, when we're not there, it's really hard to do. Um, we are not present. Um, uh, we are outside the country at this point in time as, as a donor agency. Um, and that, ma that makes it infinitely harder uh, to do that. And we rely on our own local teams to provide a lot of that for us, but they're also risking their lives on a daily basis as well um, by staying in Sudan. Um, there's obvious practical um, processes and systemic barriers, I think, that have been raised in terms of how we manage our money um, that, uh, that also inhibit our ability to, to support um, local responders. Um, we also have our own internal systemic issues with high turnover in our own teams, all these sorts of things that sort of add up um, in terms of limiting our understanding on the ground. Um, I, I think we've talked a little, it's mentioned, somebody's mentioned trust already, and, and but I do want to um, uh, also uh, emphasize that uh, our appetite for risk needs to increase um, in these in these settings, and in particular, not and I'm just not talking physically, excuse me, but also on uh, recognizing that that the local responders are the ones bearing most of the risk, and we need to shift that risk to us to ourselves um, as well. Um, and maybe one last point, um, since I as donors, it's always important to talk to each other as donors, so we can come up with common platforms um, and common ways to support. Um, and I think that's also a powerful way. Uh, to develop strategies together um, to support local responders as well. And so you can grow that movement um, across uh, um, horizontally as well. Um, I'm going to stop there um, and happy to um, engage in the discussion. Thank you so much. Great. Um, thanks a lot. And, and actually, it's, it's really good to have a development voice and a development perspective in the room so we don't treat this issue as a, in a humanitarian silo. Um, Thanks a lot to the nine um, speakers for their very um, compelling interventions. We we can now move on to the final part of the of the meeting, which, which is um, more of a, a dialogue and, and Q and A session. And in fact, if if the um, local leaders want to ask questions of the donors, or the donors want to ask questions of the local leaders, feel free to raise your hands. We've also got questions on from the um, audience, which will which will arrive at. But um, Dylan, you've got your so we'll we'll, st we'll start with Dylan, and then we'll go to the audience, and then I think we'll come to Mr. Moon, who I think had a question. But go ahead, Dylan. Uh, thanks, Michael. Uh, just a question to the to the uh, panelists, and not not the donor panelists, uh, but the mutual aid panelists. I mean, you've heard from us a little bit about our challenges, but I'd I'd really be interested in in your views on how we as as government donors, who are often a little bit distant, can can uh, best support the informal initiatives you're talking about, um, <clears throat> and and you know without doing harm to the, the 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 sort of structures that you you have put in place and that the communities have put in place. So open ended question. Thanks, Michael. Uh, good question, Dylan. Um, Dr. Madawi, did you want to come in on that? And then Hajuj. Yeah, I think there is. Yeah, I think there is a problem, especially with donors, that they are, for example, in Sudan, they are, they are channeling funds through this Sudan humanitarian fund, and this is a, a, a this is a being run by OSHA, which is actually very, very, very restrictive, very actually not flexible at all to accommodate local NGOs. Uh, although, for example, we are dealing with institutional donors ourselves, like, for example, the, the British or the USAID or, or, or others, uh, but when it comes to SHF, they say you don't have the capacity to, to, be, to be funded from this. So if you are channeling all your funds through SHF, SHF, then that means local partners are not going to make any use of these funds. Thanks, Dr. Madawi. Hajuj, did you want to come in? Yes. Um, so, so. I'll have to say like a quick, I want to say a quick uh, story. I would just uh, something that happened on the ground. There's no emergency. There's no urgency in the humanitarian aid that we have right now. 
For example, uh, a few uh, a week late before, we had a case where uh, one woman was raped and another uh, was killed. And the woman who was killed was part of our uh, emergency response rooms. And uh, when we tried to get help from to evacuate the one who got raped and whatnot, we we had to fill in this paperwork. We had to do this. We had to do that. It, we couldn't do it. So what happened was we have this thing called the women uh, groups uh, co-ops, which is a very Sudanese thing. Anyway, it's our idea of uh, uh, group cash transfer. And we had just given them. Uh, what happens with women co-ops is we have it's a group of ten to fifteen women, and uh, we had a project where we were giving them five hundred dollars. So you're talking about this is the first time this group got five hundred dollars, uh, ten to fifteen of them. And what they did was they took the money, uh, they spent three hundred dollars to get uh, a rape kit uh, to be delivered from a hospital in uh, another part of Sudan to come to them. Uh, to to the rape women, and then uh, spend the rest of their money to put them on a bus so they can leave. And that was the urgency that was needed. And they were able to do it because they're on the ground and they made the decision that what they're going to use their money for was this. And, and what we're always getting, our biggest problem is this individual cash transfer that comes and says it has to go to the most vulnerable. And the idea of the most vulnerable is such a place, who decides? And in this case, this is a case where people on the ground got the money and they decided. So there, there has to be this, this idea that urgency is very important and the way that the funding exists now has no urgency whatsoever. When we're trying to get money, we are able to, because of a lot of our helps, actually get money even from the Sudan humanitarian fund. But uh, after six months into the conflict and proving ourselves time and time again, uh, we are promised about $2 million, which we haven't seen yet. So what happens is we get the promises, there's a system. Uh, UNICEF had to change, do like, I think, 20 uh, waivers. And then after the 20 waivers, after like what people said before, everybody agrees the money needs to come to us. What happened was the computer system wouldn't allow them to go forward. So they had to get the IT person to come and change the computer system, which had to go, I don't know, all the way up. So we had to wait another uh, week or two for that to be changed. So that when we say the system does not allow it, that the, really, the system does not allow it, even on the computer level. So this needs to change. And, and I'm hoping that when it changes for Sudan, because right now, truthfully, let's just be very frank, Sudan, because of the structures we have, is a very easy example to actually try uh, uh, mutual aid. And there's no excuses that like come from the women perspective, from any perspective. This is a really easy case to do it. And hopefully, the system will be changed. So now, when you start talking about Gaza, it's like straightforward, yo, they don't have to go with what we're going through. They can be helped in the day. When you talk about other places, they can be helped in the day. So I'm hoping one thing that happens is we can help with that. Thank you. Great. Um, thanks, Hajuj. Um, maybe I'll, I'll um, turn to a couple of questions from the audience, a couple of the more voted questions and see whether any of the panelists um, um, would like to attempt a response. So it seems to me that the most voted question is from Veronique in Group Uerde, and she, she's asking whether neutrality is a challenge. How do we manage expectations from international actors and donors for neutrality? Should we, in fact, um, move away from treating neutrality as a sacred dogma and instead accept that some humanitarian actors apply neutrality and some choose not to do so and focus more on impartiality and inclusiveness. Um, so um, before I go on to a second audience question, um, do any of the speakers um, have an appetite to answer that question from Veronique? Michael, I can I can jump in and just, I mean I'm not sure if I'm answering the question, but just just a reflection. Um, I mean I think it's a really interesting question, and I know that this has been subject of much debate in the Ukraine response um, about you know whether you know whether we can really stand consistently by the the principle of neutrality and is the principle of solidarity not a more I guess realistic um, principle to be to be adhering to I mean I think it's you know it it's the, the principle of principled humanitarian assistance is need-based and impartial um, in terms of the beneficiary and I think that's 
you know, the most important thing. And I think that, of course, crises are becoming much more complex and um, much more political. So, you know, every context is different. I think it's very hard to answer that question and say yes or no. Um, you really need to, and that's what I, I, you know, one of my comments was, I think I was struck by, you know, listening to all the, the, the accounts of what's happening on the ground is that, you know, donors really need a really in-depth understanding of the political economy of aid um, before you can kind of come to these conclusions. But I do think that there is a need um, for, you know, much more, I guess, nuanced discussion around um, the principles. Thanks. Thanks, Susan. Dylan, you had your hand up um, momentarily. Did you want to chip in? Well, very, just very briefly, I mean, I, look, you know, we, we are not a neutral actor as the UK government. I hope ICRC, for example, are a neutral actor. So, so I think it depends on the agency and it depends on the context. Uh, and we should be pragmatic. Uh, and as Susan said, you know, this is this is uh, you know this is something that uh, shouldn't impede providing support to those people in need. So, so I think it's yeah, it's a it's a an obvious you know part of the globally agreed humanitarian principles and a really important part, particularly where you've got parties to conflict. Um, and and you know this is part of the Geneva Conventions as well, and 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 the ability to sort of support all sides of a conflict. So I think you know that we shouldn't lose it, but we should recognise that we are not all neutral actors, and and that uh, we still need to to get aid to those who need it. Thanks, Dylan. Neil, did you want to say something? Yes, quickly. I I think we all know deep down, uh, even the ICRC. I mean, how can you be neutral in the truest sense of the word if you can only work in the area that a government allows you to work in or that donor phone funding enables you to do it? So neutrality, I agree with you, Dylan. It's something we have to strive towards, but let's not expect it from ourselves because in, in, in our daily practice, we can't deliver on it. Whereas impartiality and inclusiveness, as Veronique was also pointing to in her answer, uh, are probably more realistic in terms of the day-to-day -day guidance. And it is what we are seeing from community-led responses also, it's, it's much closer to something you can understand. I mean, how can you be neutral and be a citizen of Myanmar? in the face of everything that's happening how can you how could you expect my grandfather to be neutral in denmark during the occupation so if we stick too hard to that neutrality principle you disable all of those people disqualify all the people who are actually doing much of this mutual aid today um, so i think having it striving towards it but also realizing it's not something we realistically can deliver to in the world today Thanks, Thanks. Niels. Um, let me just, I'm going to read out the two next most voted questions from the audience. I'll read them out uh, together, maybe in the interest of time, and then any of the panelists can can offer to respond to one or other if, if, if they wish to. So there's one from Nigel Timmins, um, who I'm, I'm guessing used to be a very senior person in Oxfam, who says... Um, I'd be interested in the speaker's views on potential risks and benefits of separating finance and authority to make decision. Channeling large sums of money, a number of practical issues come into play that are inhibitive, but is there space to be more imaginative in creating governance spaces for local voices? How can we give greater decision-making roles to women's rights activists without expecting women's rights organizations to have the organizational infrastructure to absorb large financing? So that's one. And, and the other one is from Juan Posada from Diaconia, who says, um, is, is this engagement with donors and humanitarian organizations a misappropriation of grassroots community-based tactics and strategies to regulate and control them under the legal and moral regime of, of mainstream humanitarianism? Is there a space for multiple opposing frameworks of moral and political action to come together without mainstream humanitarianism dominating mutual aid schemes? So there's a couple of... Um, thoughtful and challenging questions there does anybody does anybody in the panel have an appetite to respond
Simona, I don't know if you want to come in because you attempted a response to one of them in the chat. Yes, hello. Uh, <clears throat> hello, everyone. Uh, I was mostly uh, yeah, answering the, the secondary questions uh, as they were coming. And yes, um, I guess the tension between the framework, uh, it's real. Uh, and uh, I guess uh, that's why uh, we work with Alnam to, to create this space, to try to start talking about it. Uh, as we have heard, uh, mutual aid is a reality. Uh, and uh, how can uh, we just uh, start uh, discussing and creating that space to change how we work and um, really support what is happening anyway in any crisis. And Thanks, Simone. And uh, Vigi, you're going to come in. Yeah, sorry, just a quick answer to the first question on um, how do you how do you channel funding uh, to people who don't necessarily have, have that infrastructure? And we are also seeing that uh, there are Global South, for lack of a better term, Global South-based organizations who are trying to do this outside of the strict confines of the humanitarian aid system. So for example, NIR's change fund, um, which, is, which is still in a pilot phase, but uh, which basically has a very different way of, of deciding where that funding is needed. So it's not necessarily in the, in the most known uh, conflicts um, or disasters, but, but maybe are on a slightly smaller scale but also has a lot more simplified processes. So there are these kinds of networks and systems that are emerging, which could sort of act as the intermediaries rather than internationals um, to do this. Um, and it's not always gonna be necessary that you, you give directly to all organizations because some will not have the infrastructure to receive, but there are intermediaries who are closer to the ground or even as um, Hajuz has been talking about, uh, the emergency rooms, uh, they're again a collective, but have that infrastructure which channels money directly to the ground. So just to point that out. Thanks, Vichy. And Susan. Thanks, uh, Michael. Yeah, I mean, as you say, two, two really good questions. And um, I think they're quite, they're linked actually, um, in a way, there's a bit of overlap there. Um, and I think there is really, really important um, issues. I mean, I think that the first question around, you know, separating potentially finance and kind of decision making and looking at the governance of, of funding, I think, yes, absolutely. Because, I mean, otherwise, and it's, you know, we don't, the, the idea is not to turn these, um, you know, what we've heard about this morning is, you know, the very essence of civil society at its core. Um, you don't want to turn them into, you know, governance structures. Um, you want to let them do what they are best doing. And I think there's been some discussions around then what is the role of intermediaries if, we, if we're talking about an intermediary. And maybe it is that role of, you know, doing or support, providing support um, around the governance so that civil society can do what it's best at. And I do think that that links to the second point in the sense that, yes, we need to be very very careful that you know funding from wherever it comes from does not turn these you know grassroots organizations you know mutual aid groups civil society networks into something else um and i think the point was made earlier this morning about you know what definitely we do not want is to try and you know localize the international system we're not trying to turn these local groups into miniature versions of INGOs. And we need to be really careful that we don't go down that road. So I think they're, they're two really good points that were raised there. Thank you, Susan. Um, I've got Dylan and then Hajuj. Thanks, uh, Michael. And I was going to make a very similar point uh, to Susan. So I think, you know, we, we absolutely don't want to, in response to Nigel, you know, create uh, huge um, bureau bureaucracies out of local organisations. But I think what we do want to do is to make sure that local organisations' voices are heard in decision making. So, for example, we would want to push for local representatives in humanitarian country teams. 
I think you know we actually absolutely need uh, local representatives on the country-based pool funds and to to make those work um, effectively. Uh, and we need to, to look at whether there are other structures, for example, I mentioned the Syrian uh, one, where we where we can um, hear local voices. But I think the key thing is that we need to change how how financing works to those organisations so that they are empowered and that their capacity or is built or shared. Or I know there's sort of different terminologies around that now. Um, but so that they do have the funding to engage, so they do have the funding for leadership, so they do have the funding for advocacy work. So I think I think that's that's the important bit we we can do. And then there was also very specifically there was a quick question for me from Ruth Watson. I, I mean it's a really good question, Ruth, in terms of um, you know how the I suppose you're asking are the British public, for example, um, interested in in mutual accountability? Well. I think the, the 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 answer is probably it's a two-way process to promote it uh, and I think you know we we need to justify how we're spending taxpayers money well in order to protect the aid program which is really important um, and I think we have a collective along with um, organizations like Christian Aid uh, and, and the INGOs in the UK who are very who have a, a probably a greater reach into to the UK public and specific groups to, to, to deliver some of these messages and, and to have a conversation with the British public about this so I I put that challenge back to Michael and the INGOs, but happy to be part of it. Thanks. Um, Hajuj. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so one thing I want to say, when, when we get money, we, we actually post it right away. So our idea is, is full 100% transparency and accountability to our community to the point that donors are not comfortable with it. Like we actually ask donors, we were just going to put it out. We got this amount of money and we put it on our Facebook and we try to know whoever is uh, media or somebody from the community who wants to ask us can come to us. So, so a lot of our things is like trying to have forums where we can have uh, talk together and have open creativity. One thing we did in Sudan, uh, we're working on it right now, is a council where we one of the funds we got it was the one from Sudan Humanitarian Fund, uh, where we actually asked for a board to be established, and the board has all the local NGOs that are involved. It has the, uh, there's an international NGO that's involved, so it has them as a, a observer, and it has uh, the ERs, so reps from the ERs. So we're all sitting on the table together, and we're trying to discuss who, uh, what, what are these projects that, the, uh, uh, that are proposed by the local NGOs, and then that goes down to our uh, base ER, so they can discuss it, so they can decide what they want to do. So this is an example of the thing we, we, we insisted so that's the only way we're going to work on this fund with these local NGOs if they do this. And the amazing thing is the local NGOs are so excited about it. And right now we're trying to figure out how can we do it and how we can include and uh, get more uh, other local NGOs who are working on the area, even if they're not on this fund, to be in the meeting. So everybody can say openly, this is what I'm working on. This is the amount of money I had. So instead of competing, these local NGOs competing over uh, putting these uh, resources, is like they're putting it together and they're trying to come up with with a vision of how do we spend this money. So it's one mutual aid, uh, it goes to ERs, but it also goes to initiatives that Dr. Bowie was talking about. And at the same time, people on the ground have a say uh, on how to do it. And do, we're just trying to figure it out. And, and let's speak frank, we're trying to figure it out during the time of war. And uh, right now there's a lot of excitement about it and let's see how it is. And uh, we can talk about it later once, uh, to see how it goes. Thanks, Hajuj. Uh, Dr. Mudawi. I, I think there is a misconception that 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 donors see local NGOs or national NGOs uh, are, are less competent and, uh, and, and less transparent. That is not true. Actually, many local NGOs are are very transparent. They are, they are having all the policies that needed by international NGOs and. And they are actually, uh, you know, they are more accountable sometimes than international NGOs because they are, they are accountable to the communities before being accountable to the donor. Secondly, that, you know, it's just expensive. For example, when you engage in a, in a, in a, in a, in a funding where the international NGO is, 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 the, is the one who is receiving the funds and then channeling it to the national NGO. Sometimes over 30 percent is being deducted by the international NGO. So you can see how much this is expensive, you know, that the fund 
that percent of the fund being you know deducted by the international angle. I think donors has to think, you know, they have to assess, you know, sometimes okay, good donors there. Sometimes some donors they come and assess the national NGO, but many of the institutional donors they don't do that. While if they did it, then they can find that these national NGOs are actually reputable, they, they, are, they, are, they are transparent, uh, they have the capacity, they have the, the all the policies needed on the ground. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Lowy. We've run out of time, so um, all that remains that, that all that remains, remains for me to say is thank you so much to the nine um compelling speakers for for sparing the time to share your your entertaining thoughts with us today especially andrea so early in the morning and um and thanks a lot to alnat for bringing for bringing this um important topic um it to our attention and 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 gathering us together today and thanks a lot to the 107 people in the audience i i know that many many of the 107 people in the audience are equally as brilliant as the nine um panelists and didn't get the opportunity to be on the panel today but would have had just as exciting things to say and i'm sure that alnat will invite some of the 109 audience members to be on the panel next time around um we will we will send round a a um record of the discussions to to um to those who joined and 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 it'll be published on the alnap website and we will do our best to to answer unanswered questions that have come forward in the q a um, um as soon as possible vg did you want to come in sorry i just wanted to say we had a couple of questions from our practitioners um for our donors which we haven't been able to get to uh but i hope that we can help answer those uh, during this written phase as well and share with everyone um, if we can. So yeah, thank you everyone. Okay, my camera went pink, which means it's time to close. So um, thanks everyone for coming and see you next time. Thank you, bye-bye.